Um, and we are having a fiscal discussion. I'm hoping that we have business managers on board. Um, and if not, um, we have a lot of uh, information for your business managers and you can, um, so this is gonna be kind of a fiscally led discussion. I just wanted to first review with you um, a, an important knowing that we need to have in terms of um, our understanding of these funds. So I'm sharing, can everybody see my screen? Okay. Um, there is a preschool special education fund. As you can see, this involves special education students ages three, four, five, and two. I think I have comments turned on, but I'm, I'm viewing that. Um, so I apologize for that. <laughs> Um, so just look at the visual here, though, student, special education students ages three, four, five, and up to school age six. And in Maine, we are up to school age six because of the fact that we have section 7676 that permits children with early birthdays between July and October 15th to attend an extra year of preschool so they can attend an additional year and then enter kindergarten at the age of six. Now, some SAUs that I've worked with um, have mentioned to me that they have policies where you can only do one year of preschool. This law, however, trumps any policy you might have that would limit a family from accessing this. So I just want people to be aware that this law exists and that there is the option for, um, for, sorry, for um, our students to have an access, who have an early birthday to have access to an extra year. So again, preschool special education fund, this is the fund that was part of um, public law 2144, I think, <laughs> uh, part W of the governor's budget. Now down here, we have the EPS funding formula, which you're all familiar with. And this is for general education students. It includes four and five-year-old preschool students without IEPs and school-aged children in both general and special education, K to 12. So five to 22, as you know, in Maine to the 22nd birthday under IDEA. So EPS, we want you to be sure you understand that EPS includes four and five-year-old preschool students currently that are being funded under EPS. So it's not new information. It's not something different. What is different is now if you have a four or five-year-old on an IEP, they are going to be part of this preschool special education fund. Okay. So that is the money that's been allocated to this um, for you to pay hundred percent of the costs of these children. Uh, now I'm going to pass it to Paula, who's going to talk to you about how this money is going to flow to you, which is a very, very important piece of information. Hello, everybody. Hope you're having a great Wednesday. It's almost the second Monday, I think, of the week since Monday was a holiday. So um, I'm having computer issues, but uh, my friend Megan has a document that she was, will share that I'm just gonna go through that basically spells out the plan for, for flowing the funds for cohort one pre-K special education students. Um, and so I'm just gonna go through this real quick. Here's the plan. Um, first, we are going to estimate your the funding using an estimate count that Jen Hopkins oh, has- Paula, can I just check? Can people yes. see my, what are you seeing on the screen? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so um, we're working on getting a, a, a count of the students that are expected to be in cohort one, this grouping of three, four and five year olds with an IEP in pre-K. That will be the count that we use to determine a funding allocation that will be separate from the regular education essential programs and services model. And it will be for your general education slash FAPE administration, as well as special ed for this group of students. So I hope that's clear. <laughs> There's a lot going on there. Um, so we'll calculate an initial funding based on 
something similar to what how we calculate uh, APS funding now. We will determine how much the allocation for the year will be using these estimate counts. We will then divide it by four payments. We will give you a payment each quarter, July, October, January, April. This is different from EPS. EPS funding is provided to SAUs on a monthly basis. So the annual amount that is determined for, for your EPS allocation is split by 12 months and allocated each month. This is going to be split by four quarters and allocated each quarter. Um, the October <coughs> enrollment count will be the second collection of actual counts of the three, four, and five-year-olds with an IEP and pre-K. We will use that official count that we use every year for essential programs and services funding to um, correct the counts that we estimated to begin with for this process. We, um, so it will be part of your October 1st count when we do that. And what we will do at that time, if the three, four, and five-year-olds with an IEP in pre-K, if the count is more than we estimated originally, we will change the funding allocation for the remaining three quarters of the year and increase it accordingly. If it's less, than what we originally estimated, we will change it down in this quarter uh, for the for the remaining quarters. This is the only time throughout the year that we will that we will change the funding down. It will always it will always um, it will never go less than I can't get to your chat question, so please give me a minute to go through this, and then I'll get I'll get to them. I promise. Um, so. Um, the second quarter is the only time we will ever change your funding down. We will, however, adjust funding up in the following third and fourth quarter, January 1st, April 1st, if you have more students in the three, four, five-year-olds with an IEP in pre-K in those quarter counts than what we had given you from the October count, we will adjust your funding up in the same year. We will not go down again, though, after in those counts, even if your counts are lower. So, um, let's see, I think that, I'm going to scroll down a little bit more. Yeah, the April 1 will be the final collection of actual counts. If the count is lower than January, there's no change. If it's higher, we will increase your funding. We are still going to be, we're still figuring it out and we're probably gonna need your assistance in helping us figure out the best way to do this, being that cohort one is our first uh, cohort of doing this, uh, how we are going to allocate additional funding for, if necessary, for high cost in-district or out-of-district allocations. We realize that the funding we are allocating at this time may not be uh, as much as you need for some of those higher cost related services that some students will need. Uh, but to determine that, we'll let you know, it will likely be a collection of data similar to what we do now in the EFS 07, EFS 214, which is the out of district tuition. Uh, so it's gonna be something similar, not sure exactly how yet. Um, so in the meantime, we are asking that you please <laughs> keep all of your expenditures for three, four, and five-year-olds with an IEP and pre-K separate from your general education funding. Um, we are providing coding. We have we have set up a code for the revenue fund where this money is coming from at this time. We've, we've made that coding sheet available on our website. Um, we are updating it as we speak. So we, uh, we, we, we've got something today that we wanna put in there that's a little bit different. So that will likely change on a regular basis. We will make sure that you know if it changes, um, but we're trying to we're trying to make it the best way that it can be for the field as well as for us. Um, one thing that we know is going to have to happen is uh, the legislature and the governor and all of the uh, wonderful people that put all of this into place are going to want to know how much it's costing and if we're covering the costs properly which we obviously want to do, 
the intent is that all of the costs for these students and their education and their special education will be covered at 100% state share, which is why it's completely separate from the essential programs and services funding model so that we can do that. Um, in order to do that, we're gonna need your help, especially in this first year, to make sure that we are capturing all of those costs appropriately. Um, and then if you wanna scroll down a little bit more, Thank you, Megan. So just a few uh, things that we put together to ensure understanding, uh, both in the department <laughs> as well as in the field. Um, if a four or five year old with an IEP is attending class within an SAU, they will get an attending count in the EPS funding calculation. Not a subsidy count, not a SPED count, but they will get an attending count if they are attending class within an SAU. If a four or five year old with an IEP are attending class outside of the SAU, so they're re receiving education services outside of the SAU classrooms, they will not get an attending count in the EPS funding calculation. Three, four and five year olds with IEPs attending preschool programs in or contracted with SAUs that have assumed the FAPE obligation will be funded under the Part W transition funds. They will not be counted in EPS for subsidy, special education, or transportation calculation. The populate, this population of three, four, and five-year-olds with IEPs attending preschool programming, the Part W funding does not have a separate mechanism to fund transportation tracking of additional, so sorry, that's, that's a broken sentence that we need to fix. We realize that we have we are not capturing the transportation, so we would ask that you track if there's specific transportation for these students outside of your normal transportation expenditures. And then four-year-olds without an IEP attending a preschool program in or contracted by SAUs that assume the FAPE obligation will still be funded in EPS, but they are not included in special ed because they don't have an IEP. So. Thank you, Megan. We will, we're gonna clean this up and we're gonna provide it uh, to everybody for information. Again, these documents are <laughs> changing every day as we learn more and realize something we've forgotten or realize uh, something that you have brought to our attention that should have been addressed. Uh, we appreciate your patience as we uh, build the plane while we're flying it. Uh, we've got both wings, I think now, we're just looking for the tail fin. <laughs> um so now Paula, I will try can to get I to um address the questions. chat with you? Yes. Um I'm I'm going to ask the EPS funding formula is based on enrollment from the previous year, correct? Um it's based on uh, sort of. <laughs> so we calculate funding for EPS. Um this let me just give an example. This October one count is averaged with last year's October one count to determine FY26 funding. We've already calculated FY25 funding the, the year that starts July one. And the FY25 funding we calculated last December and made it public in January so that you could all do your budgets your uh, uh, for, for this coming year. And we, to do that, we used the most recent available counts, which were October 1, 2023, and October 1, 2022 averages. So to answer the question about the funding of the preschool special education program fund, that's based on your child count, in, not child count, I won't use that word. That's based on your CDS data of how many children you have coming into preschool three, no. four, or five who are on an IEP. That's happening. That's the number of children that we have already shared with you, anticipated. There are still referrals and referrals occur, as many of you know, throughout the summer. After July 1, the referral shifts to the SAU for CDS because we then don't have time to complete the evaluation prior to the school year starting. So that August money, that August payment, and Paula, please correct me if I'm wrong, or Megan, um, 
is directly from your CDS child count. And then there's an adjustment made in October when that number goes up. Now, anyone on C in CDS will tell you that we start light and we end heavy, right? So we have referrals all throughout the school year with the majority of them happening between January and April. So it's likely that your sped count, your, spe your special education counts are going to increase in the beginning of next year as children are emerging as needing additional services. So that's just, um, just to kind of caution you to say those adjustments are going to be helpful because it's likely that your um, we've seen increased referrals to special education continually, uh, but that's been a long time trend for CDS that most of our referrals are, they just kind of build throughout the school year. Right, so the current numbers that we're going to be using, uh, Jennifer is helping, Jennifer Hopkins is helping us to get from, I believe it's the CDS system sync, um, I my plan is once we have those finalized for the funding for each of the cohorts is to uh, reach out to the cohort and say this is what we are planning to fund you at these are the numbers we've received do you agree do you disagree and then we'll talk and if you disagree I'll refer you to Aaron and if you agree I'll refer you to Megan just for fun thanks <laughs> you're welcome just kidding so uh, you will have a time to review, a chance to review them before the official funding is allocated. Uh, Aaron mentioned August, and I forgot to, uh, as you may or may not realize, because of when the legislature um, adjourned, the funding for this cannot be available until August 9th. We will, however, get you the first quarter of funding as soon as possible after August 9th. We plan to have everything ready to go by that date to try to get that out to you as quickly as possible. The other quarters Good. we Good. hope to have, the other quarters we hope to have earlier as as early as possible in each of the quarters, um, October, January, April. But that's going to also be dependent upon when we get those counts from you. So, obviously, the October count, um, and then. We, we will be doing January and April collections of, of, of in, increased pre-K three, four or five year olds that may have come into the system in the meantime. This is all brand new to me. So please forgive my hesitation as I say the words count in April and count in January. So the link for coding, um, we can resend that with our materials. We have an initial coding for preschool for this special education, this preschool special education program fund. We also are sending out. Can the I just link. ask a quick question, uh, Paula? I've got that link up right now, but I know that you identified a couple of things to change in the chart, chart of accounts. Yeah. So do we want to hold on sending that link right now and just make sure it's cleaned up so we send it once? If you can give us until tomorrow uh, mid-morning, we did have a couple of adjustments we made this afternoon that I have not had time to get put into the web, web version yet. Okay. Um, so yes, we will get that to you within the next, and by the way, these materials will probably come to you tomorrow because Jen Hopkins is out today, but she'll be back tomorrow. Um, if we have a student that is by before July 1 who has an IEP and we determine, uh, can we determine that the they should repeat pre-K, who would they be funded through? Um, I have someone at my door right now. I don't know if any of you could take that question, but yeah, um, I can take this. thank you. So if they are eligible to stay in pre-K, which I don't remember the number, but there's a number that makes that, makes that possible. Uh, then they are still considered eligible for funding through this, um, what are we calling it? Pre-K special ed funding. There we go. Um, are you so, talking about extended Part D, Paul, Part B, Paul? Yes. Who said that? Oh, I think you mean, I think they were talking about a couple of different things. Um, are they? Okay. We talk about extended Part C, 
um, that is extending the option for a family to to stick with the IFSP. Um, and that happens. It's a five-year-old. I understand. Okay. But when you were talking about extended option, that is referring to part C, the C to B transition. But um, I think part of what Paula was referring to was section 676. Um, and that is for a select number of children mm -hmm. whose birthdays fall between the, July July and October. July and October. So it depends on when that five-year-old, uh, well, it's funny, it's a four-year-old is turning five, right? Aaron? Yeah. Aaron, yeah. Take it's, back now. It's, it's, very very challenging. it's very challenging. So this is the other caveat in this law is that the child must have an IEP before December, help me CDS people, 31st. December, no, 30, December 1st. December 1st. Yep. So random. December 1st, the year prior that they enter kindergarten. If they have an active IEP by December 1st, the year prior to entering kindergarten, and they turn five between July 1 and October 15th, they're eligible for an, ex an extra year of preschool. Now, this determination is a team determination, but it's often um, a parental choice and they would like to um, extend preschool. And um, so that is, again, that would trump any policy you have around whether or not <clears throat> you want to do um, an additional year. You can think of it like a retention, but it is very, it's, it's the, it's a very specific law and there's very much criteria around it. Um, so in other words, the, there may be some 676 children in your SAUs and we will get you that information incoming to your, uh, but it is, you know, given the, um, the SAUs that are in this group, it would be a limited number of children in, in each of your SAUs. It might be one, if any, it not is, is likely not to be two people, two children. So that is the um, 676 law that, you know, I think that a lot of times in CDS, there has been hesitancy from a parent to enter preschool or kindergarten and, um, having your children in this program may make a difference in that conversation where, where families are feeling more comfortable in accessing that educational offer. So, um, but it is a very, a very uh, technical law and uh, CDS, the site directors in CDS know it like the back of their hands. So if you ever have any questions, you can reach out to them and uh, we will identify for you if there's any 676 children coming your way so that you can know about them. And Nicole just provided some additional helpful information in the chat, um, sort of on that. Nicole? Yeah, I didn't want to stir the pot more or cause more confusion, Megan. I just wanted to clarify that um, a, a child who's age eligible for kindergarten, but a team determines that they should receive their education in the pre-K setting, that's fine. It's not based on their birth date or 676 or anything like that. It, the 676 is just going to apply to that, that special birth date years of children who want to stay under CDS services and not move to school-based. So going back to the question that um, Sue Carter asked around having a, a student that's five before July 1, if the IEP team determines that it makes more sense for the child to stay in pre-K, that can be an IEP team decision. Yes, it is an IEP team decision. And they would get funded through this pre-K special ed funding. Next question is Stacy Shorey, if we're okay with that one, moving on. Stacy, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that one. We're still figuring that one out. Mm -hmm. um, we're still trying to determine how we want to do that. I, I And so I'm, I'm just, we're gonna get back to you on that. We have not forgotten that you have that happening though. Okay. So thank you for the reminder. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, and then going down to Beth Talman, can you give more clarity on the attending preschool within the SAU? We will only have two public pre-K general education. 
so may need to place a student in a private local pre-K to access as needed. Will these students still be on our counts? Yes. So if you are taking, if you are taking on the responsibility of general education slash FAPE, as well as special education for three, four, and five-year-olds in pre-K, you will get funding for them separate from the essential programs and services funding. The only ones that you will get an attending count in EPS, because that's part of your operation of school, are those that are in seats, in classes, in your SAU. Any of those that are being serviced in a private location outside, you don't get an attending count in EPS either because you're getting funded for that outside of EPS. Does that help? It's a very confusing thing. I it, can say it again if you like. No, it does help. It is it is still really confusing because I think we'll have a variety of different models in which we you meet will. students. So I think we'll just have to be in close consultation to make sure that we understand where you want them accounted for. Yeah, you, me, and Kathy Warren, Kim Hall, and Allie Cookson on the data team are gonna to get to know each other very well regarding <laughs> all of these students and where they're gonna count. Okay. But in, yeah. in terms of, you know, we have good models that are already in place throughout the state where states, and I'm kind of looking at Nicole Medor again, um, where a lot of SAUs are doing exactly that. They're contracting with local providers and you know sending students to them. So folks from our early learning team will also be um, really instrumental in supporting that. Another consideration, Beth, that you should make is you should be thinking about is if you want to use a contracted service for, for special education or if you want to um, send your own providers in to provide special education, especially if it's like a speech language service two times a week, that might be something. And then that would kind of impact your payment to a general education program because you're providing the special education costs. So it's just something I want people to be thinking about when you are partnering, if it's possible for you to provide that service, especially if it's a it's a small dose of a service. Um, so be thinking about that and kind of trying to plan on that as you're, as you're working your, your understanding of who your partners are going to be. No, I absolutely agree with you. I think we will, I think that's where we're going to land in a confusing spot because I think we'll have a little bit of a hybrid because I think we will service probably the related services in those settings. But then if we have a student that requires some SDI, their placement wouldn't be at our pre-K necessarily, unless we have space. So that's where it will get a little messier. That's okay. And let me real quick explain why it matters. An attending count is not going to necessarily help you if you don't have the staff also, because the attending count in a district is what determines your EPS rate and the cost of operating a school. So if you have too many attending students and you, they aren't actually attending where your staff are, then that's going to skew the EPS rate and that's not going to be good. So we're going to very carefully determine if it's really an attending or not, because we want it to ha be helpful to the district, but we don't want it to harm the district. And that's why it matters. That is super helpful. Thank you. Yes, because we started the initiative to do the two general ed pre-Ks this year prior to agreeing to being the early adopters. And we set up our classrooms already to align with the profile of the district. So that's why I think we're gonna have to service in other places. So that's super helpful. Absolutely, and that's fine again, but we, we wanna do the least harm and do the most good. Perfect. So we will figure that out together. Thank you. Were there any others? Any other questions? You can also speak them out if you would like. Um, what I do want to alert you to though, is I will be sending you the just very simple infographic of who's covered under what funding formula. There's some other funding formulas, as you know, that are out there. Some of you have PDG grant coming in. Some of you um, are getting some equipment and furniture and have had a visit from Lori Whittemore. Um, so we're gonna make all of this really, um, we're going to be working with you closely. And what we would like to do is 
set up a focus group with your business managers and of course, anyone you would like to attend. Because one of the things that we have to do in this special, uh, the preschool special education program fund is try to tease out in that fund how much your general education cost is. And so in order to do that, we have to work very closely with you to make sure that things are being coded for that group in particular, but also for your preschool students who are in the EPS funding formula so that at the end of this year, we have the best and most accurate information in regard to how we are coding and how we are spending money and what is the actual cost. So this is going to be crucial and we really need to partner with you in order to um, make this very transparent for all of us so that you understand it, we understand it, and we can look at trends over time and we know how to look at next year's planning for this group as well. So more on that, we'll be connecting with you to kind of determine a best time and date um, for your business managers to attend that focus group or also including um, MASBO and that um, organization will be involved in this as well. So again, this is really kind of an opportunity for us to really hone in on what the cost is so that we can do the best planning in order to support 100% of your special education costs in this grade range moving forward. So any questions about any of those things? There are two questions in the chat I wanna make sure that we address. Uh, Beth asked about whether or not we see the referral timeline shifting as we get closer to 2028 so that it includes language of school days since uh, we're not contracted with our staff by in August. So that is something that is in, in Muser and is um, and we do have a the um, a potential rewrite of Muser and we're trying to redraft Muser as many of you know. Um, we likely won't change that requirement based on the the necessity to identify early for that age group. And that is why Muser was originally calculated that way so that we wouldn't lose the summer months in determining eligibility for children in this age group. That being said, CDS um, does have staff that um, is contracted to provide these evaluations through the calendar year. And so that is something that can be supported through the CDS support and service hubs. If, as I know you do, you have school psychologists who do not work over the summer. So um, and that being said, though, that is likely not going to be a change we would recommend given the, um, this age level and the importance of early identification. Um, there's another question from Catherine uh, about for initial calculation, will CDS count also include the services to children that uh, the children require? Um, Aaron or, or um, Paula, do you wanna take that one or do you want me to take it? Um, I'm thinking that what um, Catherine is referring to is a child who might be placed in an out of unit high cost placement as they're coming into your, um, and so that is something that I think we will need to table for the next meeting. Um, we are going to stagger these meetings um, to kind of afford us the opportunity to connect within these timeframes. So our next fiscal meeting will be not next week, but the week after. And um, that will be on our list of questions that we will be um, alerting you to. Next week, we will be working on the CDS service and support hubs and how we might create an MOU to support you in the work that you're doing. Um, I wanted to add just one piece of information. Um, there's a really cool mapping or GIS project that's underway um, that will basically provide for each of the SAUs um, a breakdown of what are the licensed child care centers in your area or in your um, catchment area. Um, and so that's going to be a map that's an interactive map that'll be available for you to look at and to be able to identify who are the licensed providers in your catchment area. It's pretty neat. That is very cool. 
So that's all we have for you today. Um, we will give you this recording and we will also give you all of the information we reviewed today. And we look forward to seeing you next week where we're gonna be talking more about what we might identify as a service for you in the service and support hubs. As usual, please send any questions you have in between meetings to Jen Hopkins and we will see you shortly. Have a great afternoon.